So I just flew in today. So for me, this is actually still a mobile Sunday. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is actually kind of a, uh, uh, a f um, uh, it's a, it's a really uh, an honor to be here. It's it's great to be here. There's this uh, kind of funny. This is your life moment. Stefan, who's the first person who talked. Uh, uh, I think when he was like 12 years old, he was an intern at a company that I worked at. Uh, and then and then Willem, of course, is uh, currently at Adaptive Path. So it's just like weird. Like oh, you know, I just kind of arrived at home again. So. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start off by uh, telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a user experience designer and entrepreneur. I was one of the first professional web designers starting in 1993. Since then, I've worked on the user experience design of hundreds of websites. Uh, I um, also consult on the design of digital consumer products. I've helped uh, consumer electronics and appliance manufacturers create better user experiences. I've uh, uh, helped companies reorganize the uh, their design cultures and their development cultures to be more user-centered. Um, that's basically how you sum summarize like 20 years of consulting, I guess. So um, uh, I sat out the first dot-com crash writing a book based on the work I'd been doing. It's a cookbook of user research methods. Then um, I uh, founded a design and consulting company called Adaptive Path. Uh, then I left Adaptive Path and the whole web behind in 2004. Um, although not entirely behind, because I had to come back, because uh, there was interesting stuff happening again. But uh, what I did is I founded a uh, company with Todd Kurt called Thingam in 2006. We're a um, small, ubiquitous computing company. Uh, what we do, I'll show you a little bit about what we do later, but uh, we design, manufacture, and sell Ubicomp hardware. We're a micro OEM. We're a two and a half person uh, OEM. So uh, this talk is based on a chapter from my new book uh, on ubiquitous computing user experience design. It came out in September, or at least in the US, although you can probably buy it here. Uh, and it's called Smart Things. It's published by Morgan Kaufman, which is an imprint of Elsevier. So this book is my attempt at creating a framework for the different kinds of activities and the products of those activities involved in the design of devices that use information processing, but which are not general purpose computers. Uh, they're not seen as computers. They're, uh, they're not uh, treated as computers by uh, people. So to, as a designer, I find it very useful to have interesting constraints. And so this, is, uh, this book is my way of you know, trying to create some. Um, so let me just tell you just like one final thing. So the book is actually fairly practical. You know, there's a lot of kind of examples and, uh, uh, and stuff in there. But um, I also try to articulate uh, uh, general ideas that kind of def uh, define the design context uh, of it, and so this talk is actually totally from the uh, giant hand wavy big idea part of it. So um, you know, pardon me if I go astray. So um, what I want to do is I want to start by mentioning a uh, what I call consider to be kind of a curious phenomenon for those of you who have been following developments in microprocessors over the last 20 years, uh, because you'll notice the clock speed of today's new CPUs is basically the same as it was five years ago. So for those who've uh, been following uh, this, for those like me who started uh, uh, using computers in the internet in the early 80s, um, uh, this is very, very confusing because we watched the clock speed go from six megahertz in about 1983 to three gigahertz in 2003. And uh, we got used to uh, clock speed as the measure of value and power in information processing. But uh, an interesting thing happened in 2004. After 20 years of logarith logarithmic growth, um, somebody pulled the handbrake on the, uh, on the thing. And so clock speeds abruptly stopped going up in 2004. The industry went from exponential growth in clock speeds to no growth, to zero growth in one season. So I call this phenomenon peak megahertz. So, um, but unlike oil, uh, we're not actually running out of CPU clock cycles. What we are is we're seeing a reevaluation uh, of how we understand the value that computers provide. And this has resulted in the shift in the strategy of microprocessor makers. So what happened in 2004, very broadly speaking, is that chip manufacturers saw that they were running out of uses, that we were running out of uses for big, energy-hungry, hot processors. So they shifted the game. So since then, the competition has shifted from raw CPU to making smaller, cooler, cheaper chips that can do as much, as, as much work as older chips did 
and even as much as entire subsystems of computers did while using fewer resources. Just to back this up, here's a slide from Paul Ottolini, from a talk Paul Ottolini, the CEO of Intel, gave last year. Notice that instead of talking about numbers going up, process, uh, processor manufacturing has become all about pushing numbers down. Like, big companies generally don't talk about how much their numbers are going down and find it like to be a great idea. Because now what they're doing is that instead of competing on doing more with more, what they're doing is they're now competing on doing the same with less. Less power, smaller size, lower cost. So one of the main effects of this is that in addition to pushing the price, size, and energy consumption down, it also, of, of the latest CPUs down, it also pushes the price of all previous processing technologies down along with it. So uh, at the beginning of the internet era, back when I think Stefan was uh, uh, 11, uh, <laughs> we had 46s at the state of the art. And they cost about $1,500 in today's dollars. So um, a 46 is the processor that the web was built with and for. It was the machine that was on the desktops of the people who were building the web. It was the machine that was in the, ra uh, in the servers. So today, you can buy that same amount of processing for about 50 cents. And it uses only a fraction of the energy. Uh, and it uses only a fraction of the energy, and it's uh, uh, much smaller and obviously much cheaper. That de decrease in price is the same three orders of magnitude as the increase in speed. And this is not a coincidence because both are products of the same underlying technological change. So what happens when a technology gets really cheap? When a technology gets really cheap, it opens up enormous possibilities for new products while creating fundamental ch changes in society as the new technologies displace existing social systems and networks. Steam engines lower the price of harnessing energy similarly by about three orders of magnitude. And the Industrial Revolution was born as people found all kinds of new uses for mechanical energy. Mechanization suddenly became an option for making and using things where it never existed or it was highly impractical. You can see a similar transformative effect when you look at what happened in the price of extracting aluminum when it dropped a similar uh, number of orders of magnitude in 1885. Or when electric motors became significantly cheaper in the 1920s. When something becomes cheap, it quickly joins the toolkit of things that we use to create our world with. It became, becomes a design material. You know, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. In the last five years, small processors have drastically lowered the cost of taking information in, evaluating it, rearranging it, and acting on it. It's no longer unthinkable to have an everyday object uh, that uses an embedded processor take a small piece of information, say the temperature or your schedule, and, auto, and autonomously act on it to help that device do its uh, job better. So to just to hammer the point further, this is a new system on a chip for microchip. It's got about as much processing power as that initial 46, um, but it also has an onboard video controller that can drive a VGA screen, a USB controller, 24-channel analog to digital converter for sensors, and a capacitive sensing driver that can drive a touch screen. It's about five bucks. It uses less power than a keyring LED and fits on the chip of the size of your fingernail. It is also not unusual. Every single semiconductor manufacturer has uh, uh, the equivalent processor. The uh, iPad and the iPhone are based on basically uh, $30 versions of the same thing. So products like this mean that enabling objects to make autonomous decisions and act on arbitrary information has now joined the palette of options that a product designer has to work with in creating a compelling, effective new product, regardless of what that product is. You know, toy makers regularly compete by making a product uh, uh, with cheaper materials or not by making a product with cheaper materials, but just by, uh, by adding behavior to create a competitive advantage. You know, behavior and polyester are now roughly equivalent. So I believe this is, this is as big of an infrastructural change in our world as electrification, as steam power, and as mechanical printing. Maybe as big a deal as like bricks. I mean, seriously, it's a big deal. So um, if information is the design material, what are its material properties? You know, sure, at some level, there are basic information theoretical things like bandwidth and noise and complexity, but those are microscopic properties, the equivalent of basic nuclear forces when really we're talking about material properties. You know, you know uh, thinking about bandwidth, it won't help me design a Tickle Me Elmo. You know, but, that's, but a Tickle Me Elmo is a device that's only practical when using cheap information as a material. So I want to look at what are the macroscopic properties of information that we can design with. And what I'm going to talk about now, you'll find many of these things familiar, but what I want you to do is to step back and re-examine these properties anew. 
because each represents a new possibility space, a new way of thinking about what it means to design our living world. So to run through this list quickly, because I see that I am, um, oh, I've got many slides left. So, um, so when you make something with information, it can sense the world. You know, it can autonomously and automatically sense the world. There are thousands of sensors that convert states of the world into electrical signals. This also includes sensors that sense human intention. You know, we call these uh, magical sensors buttons or knobs or levers. So actuators are the, is the generic term for anything that can make a physical change based on input and can be triggered based on information. Thus, information can be used to autonomously affect the world in a way that no previous material is, was capable of. Information can be used to store knowledge about a state of the world and then to act on it later. You know, this can just be a single uh, piece of data, you know, like what a mechanical thermostat does. Or it can be something much more sophisticated, like you know, an image of everything you've ever looked at. That's exactly what Justin TV was doing a couple of years ago. So one of the most transformative qualities of information is it can be duplicated exactly and transmitted flawlessly. We know what happened to music when, uh, when that took off. But what it also means is that device behavior can now be replicated exactly. You know, we've been acclimated to this. Uh, but stepping back, the idea of near exact replication in a world full of randomness and uncertainty is a really amazing thing. It's a core part of what makes working with information so powerful. So uh, networking, of course, enables devices made with information to communicate autonomously. So um, the cactus on the right communicates uh, with its immediate environment through chemical and biological means. You know, tr it's a traditional cactus, you know. Uh, you know, it replicates, it respirates, it sends out roots, and if you get too close, uh, it, it, you know, it might communicate with you in other ways. Um, but it's actually, it's, its scope of communication is pretty small. Um, the cactus on the left is one with made, it, uh, made with information. It's a cell tower. So it's not as self-contained as the cactus on the right. Um, and, uh, you know, it can't replicate itself, but it, communicate in, it can communicate autonomously with the whole world at the speed of light. And it can send machine-to-machine -machine telemetry, Google map tiles, pictures of friends. You know, um, the ecosystem of the cactus on the left, the, well, let me just say, the e ecosystem of the cactus on the right is the southwestern United States. It's fairly limited. The ecosystem of the one on the left is the entire world. So, Information enables, further enables behavior that's in orders of magnitude more complex than what's possible with mechanics or traditional forms of materials, traditional uh, material processing at a fraction of the cost. So this is a modern small airplane avionics system. You know, it consists of a, a bunch of um, standard computers running special software. You know, when you fly in, an air, in, in a modern small airplane, it's kind of like flying in a, fly, in a flight simulator. You know, it's, uh, you're doing roughly the same thing, but you're actually flying. Uh, compare that to a traditional gyroscopic autopilot. Every single component in this thing is unique, and it actually does very, very little. And to change its behavior, you've got to completely re-engineer the whole freaking thing. So when you make something with information, you enable that thing to have behaviors that are vastly more sophisticated than was possible with any previous kind of material. So finally, information lets you encode knowledge. Modern cars, you know, those of you who drive cars here, often, you know, if, if you've ever driven a car with a choke, you'll know what a, what a stall is, when your car stalls. Modern cars don't stall because the engineers have, uh, have used sensors and actuators to embody their knowledge of internal combustion into a set of algorithms that adjust the car's performance dynamically. They used to do that, too, with metal. You know, that's, that's what a carburetor is. But it's just oh, so much more work to do it with a carburetor than to do it uh, uh, with information. With information, it just goes super, you know. That's why cars don't stall anymore. That's also why you can't fix them in your garage. So this is, uh, uh, so you're wondering why I'm talking about cars when there's a blender on screen. So this is a BlendTech programmable kitchen blender. So with it, you can pro program a sequence of blender power, speed, and duration, and associate that sequence with a single button on the blender. Why do you want to do this? Because this allows you to embed the experience and knowledge about food processing into that button, so that a company like Jamba Juice, which is a, a smoothie maker in the US, doesn't have to train its staff 
in how to blend stuff. They train them on how to push a button. Their, their, uh, uh, their business model depends on the embedded knowledge that's in this blender. Would not have been possible, or certainly not practical, before informa uh, information uh, was being used as a material. So if you just went through, uh, if you just said, hey, you know, I know all this. Norbert Wiener talked about cybernetics in 1948. You're absolutely right. Norbert Wiener talked about all this stuff in 1948. It's not new. Um, however, uh, it is actually now relevant. <laughs> because uh, just like Leonardo da Vinci said, you know, this flight stuff, you know, we could possibly do that. But we couldn't do it practically, and we couldn't do it on a large scale until Douglas Aircraft started using aluminum to make widespread commercial flight. You know, we are now at a point where this theory can become reality, and we are now in a position where we actually have, uh, uh, have to kind of make it happen. Like, it's, it's happening already. So now what I would like to do is, uh, uh, is speculate about how this uh, affects design in the world at large, um, you know, this larger phenomenon. So first, the first thing that happens is it changes the way that we think about uh, building hardware. Information encodes knowledge, and so therefore it makes it easier to uh, reduce complexity, which includes the complexity of information technology itself. And I know I've just recursed, but let me ta talk about this. So em embedded processing makes it possible to create an abstraction layer around basic sensing, processing, and actuation to create building blocks that are meaningful in human terms rather than just electronic terms. Each block is an atom of functionality that has a CPU and communicates with other blocks over a network. Now, this is the start of object-oriented hardware. What you see here are all primarily prototyping systems that, uh, uh, that, um, make it, uh, that I'm using to demonstrate this. But this is actually already happening. This is already how modern devices are constructed. If you look at... Um, so this, so this is a uh, iSupply teardown of the Nokia N8. So uh, if you look at uh, iSupply's teardowns of, uh, of devices, you know, so I don't know if, uh, how many of you have you ever looked at this. What they do is they buy a device off the shelf, they rip it open, and they count all the chips, and they see who made it. And then they make a list of how much it costs. So and this is where you find out that a Nokia N8 costs Nokia approximately five cents more than a uh, iPhone 4 costs Apple. So, um, um, but what you see is that none of the components are made by Nokia. They don't really make anything. What they do is they pull components off the shelf, like Lego bricks, and they combine them to make a final product. This is already object-oriented hardware. So from an interaction design perspective, from a des device design perspective, object-oriented hardware means that rather than starting from basic principles, like figuring out like, what capacitor to use, you can start thinking about what is the experience that I want people to have? What is the sensor that I want to use for a specific experience? I don't really even have to worry about how that sensor works. So, you know, it's the, it's the same thing. Like, if, if, you're, if you're a product designer, I mean, you're not smelting your own metal. You know, you're not growing your own hardwood trees. You're using them as a design material. So this is what my company does right now, is what we do is we make a set of such atoms for designing with light. Our Blinkum line of smart LED products makes it very easy to put controllable light into arbitrary location, locations with no knowledge of electronics or color theory. Pick some up at fine electronic retailers worldwide. OK. So pitch, end of pitch. So what do we make with these atoms? So on the next larger scale, we, will, we see and are seeing new personal tools, digital pedometers, internet-connected bathroom scales, networking parking meters, cars that don't stall. But there will actually be much more, because if you pick any object and you add information to it, you get a new object. It's kind of awesome. My favorite example of this is the Adidas One Shoe, which was put out five years ago and then immediately discontinued, I think because it's a really ugly running shoe. So it's got a pressure sensor uh, that uh, is used by a small embedded processor to estimate the qualities of the running surface being, uh, being run on. And then there's an actuator in the heel that changes the springiness characteristic in response in between strides. So the, uh, as you're running, what it's doing is it's trying to estimate the optimal, trying to uh, uh, use the knowledge that's embedded in it, uh, in it 
uh, to uh, uh, create an optimal running experience based on the running surface that, uh, that you're on. The buttons that are in the instep um, adjust how it responds. They're, they, they, they adjust the performance envelope. You know, for me, it represents how a really small amount of information carefully deployed can profoundly change an object. So when Nike and Apple uh, uh, took this same basic concept, what they did is they shifted the emphasis from actuation to communication. They kind of sw like kept most of the same stuff there, but they swapped out this, uh, this one thing. And what, what happened with that is that that same little piece of information um, uh, changed your shoe from something that you run on to an entry point to, uh, of a new way of experiencing the world. Now you get analytics, a social network, you get games, you get all the other things that the web does well. The boundary of, uh, what the, uh, the boundary of what value the object provides and where, that uh, and where the value uh, that object gives you and where that value lies, is it, in the, is it in the shoe or is it in the cloud? The, uh, uh, the notion of what the value is in that object has now profoundly shifted. So changing gears here a bit, when a, uh, when a material becomes this cheap, it can be used for non-essential purposes. So um, you can use wood to build up a house, or you can use it as decoration. I live in San Francisco, which is famous for its 19th century Victorians, one of my neighbors. Um, uh, in San Francisco, Victorians use as much wood for decoration as they use to hold up the roof. Why is that? You know, why, why did gingerbread exist? Well, it's because wood was really cheap. California was covered in forests in the 19th century. And earthquakes, um, and it had earthquakes. And, earth, and bricks, bricks really suck in an earthquake. <laughs> so um, there was also cheap mechanical energy because steam power had gotten really, really cheap at this point. So when people got some money, it was actually a really cheap way to use this, uh, these materials to really express themselves, to become very, very exuberant in their expression of their own personal lives through, this, uh, uh, through the objects that they created and they used. So information is going to follow the same route. And it will be used to create incredibly be beautiful, profound aesthetic experiences. You know, it's already revolutionized music and cinema. Um, but this is going to be a totally new thing. You know, it's, it's increasingly becoming decoupled from its functional properties and being used for its aesthetic properties. You know, a lot of data visualization today is, is you know, more about decoration than it is about information analysis or communication. Those things just mean nothing. <laughs> and that trend is going to continue. But they're beautiful. So the surfaces of our world are going, to become, uh, are going to start to shimmer, and they're going to start to react just to be beautiful. And there's going to be information, data information kitsch. You know, we're going to start to see media facades and everything. We're just going to be really tired of it. You're going to say, oh, my house looks like Las Vegas again. So, but what this does is this essentially uh, talks about how our relationship to electronics is really changing. And we're starting to see objects made with, uh, uh, with information as more than just disposable consumer electronics but it's something that uh, can become an inherent part of our lives. You know, if it's beautiful, wh why do you need a new one next year? It's, it's still going to be beautiful next year, you know, or will it? You know, Matt Cottom, who's an industrial designer who lives here in Amsterdam, has started exploring the concept of heirloom electronics. This is one of his explorations. You know, what does it take to create devices made with information that have both the operational longevity and the long-term utility of traditional heirlooms? How can we integrate the functional and aesthetic properties of electronics such that our digital devices do not become less interesting and less useful with time? However, that actually goes against the general trend, which is for digital devices to become less permanent, to become increasingly more ephemeral as we redefine where the value lies in a given device. And this is just not, not, not just about the disposability of consumer electronics. You know, making objects with information makes uh, physical objects increasingly less valuable. An ATM, for example, is a computer. You know, you've probably all seen the blue screen of death on a random ATM. Um, but it's useless without the network that it's connected to. It is completely useless without the network. It exists only to provide access to a, to a system. You know, a mobile phone, basically the same thing. Not really useful without the network. Um, 
And such services ex existed before, but now it's just really easy to make them. We have lots of them in our environment right now. I call them service avatars. And they're the physical representatives of services that are in the cloud. And uh, what that means is that means the, uh, the device dissolves in light of the light of the service. So let me give you an example uh, uh, quickly, since I, I'm way over time and uh, there are still seven or eight slides. So, <laughs> so a camera, um, what's a camera? Well, a digital camera can be thought of as a really good appliance for taking photos for Flickr. And a phone, well, that's a really convenient way to take your Flickr, uh, Flickr pictures on the road. And your TV, well, that's just a really great high-resolution Flickr display. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 what that means is that as hardware becomes more specialized, it also becomes, uh, and, and it gets connected to services, it becomes devalued because people see through it. And there may not actually be anything wrong with this. It's just, that, that's just how it is. Let's talk about Netflix. You know, you can get Netflix on virtually any device that has a screen and a network connection. You can pause a Netflix film, uh, uh, film over here and unpause it over there. What, think about your relationship to the device and to Netflix. You know, the brand loyalty, the focus on the service is not on the frame that it's being, uh, uh, that it, that it's being played in. The focus is on Netflix. You're still thinking of it as Netflix. The thing, you're looking through the device to the service. The service is the thing that has the value. When objects made with uh, are made with information, we begin to see the world in terms of services, not the things that are delivering them. So even non-digital objects augmented with information similarly de dematerialize. You know, as they cast information shadows into the, into the cloud, our experience of them changes from being primarily about the object to its role in terms of all the other digital and non-digital objects. You know, now that I can get uh, uh, metadata and telemetry about this cantaloupe, I wonder where it was yesterday. I wonder which of my friends has bought a cantaloupe like this. I wonder how I compost the rind. You know, has that ever mattered to me? Well, well now actually it, it kind of might, because it's now an option. You know, the physical experience has become a data experience simultaneously as it is a physical experience. This in turn leads to our uh, notion of ownership. Our notion of ownership changes when physical objects become avatars. Everything becomes a possibility space instead of the thing that it is. You know, it becomes a signpost rather than the end point. You know, I now look at a bookshelf and I see a bunch of searchable data. I look at my clothes and I see a product service system about to come uh, to fruition. I look at a plate of food and I see a temporary node in a system that goes from the farm and then back to the farm through me. Adding information to the makeup of any object doesn't just dematerialize it into a service. It profoundly changes it and changes our relationship to it at every level. So our environment is increasingly becoming information based on a fractal level. Small information devices make large information devices that can uh, combine to form environment-sized devices made with information as a core. And we need to renegotiate our understanding of every object we come in contact with, just as we do with every previous technology. And there's a great opportunity here to create an ecology of services embodied as robust, valuable, exciting new tools, as new kinds of devices we've never thought of before, you know, that have uh, item-level identification, wireless networks, you know, whole classes of things can enrich our lives, you know, things made with information, can enrich our lives and our pocketbooks thanks to this. But yet, there will always be negotiation. And yet, that will always have to be done by designers, because every new material creates both possibilities and problems. You know, we didn't get flying cars, but we didn't act, have to fight atomic hydroplaning Soviet battleships. <laughs> and both of these were equally legitimate possibilities for technological progress in the mid-1950s. We went somewhere else entirely. And we renegotiated our relationship to all these technologies as we went. And designers were the medium through which that negotiation happened. So we are at the beginning of this enormous structural change in the nature of the objects that surround us. Now, just as we experienced in the chemical revolution of the, uh, the mid-20th century, 
or the energy revolution of the late 19th century, or the industrial revolution of 200 years ago. You know, the history of technology is essentially a history of, uh, of shocks and renegotiations created by new technological possibilities. And some, some of the products of each of those revolutions are undeniably good, and some of them are undeniably bad, but it's really hard to predict which one is which when you're deep in it. Thus, I think it's our responsibility as creators of information technology to understand the properties of information as a material, to explore its capabilities, and to build tools that make it easier to do the right thing with information than to do the wrong thing. And that is more our responsibility than it is Intel's, than it is LG's, or it's the government's. You know, they're just mining the raw ore. We're the ones who actually decide what to make with it. Thank you.